In case you don't know what ATF means. ATF is addicted to fresh. ATF is the name of my crew and I'm the general. Holla. ATF. I think I'm the guy who got on Jay's nerves the most. Mm -hmm. um, all of his, his people was just like, oh, you need to rap, you need to rap, you need to rap. Because he was always like a great MC. Like I've known him since he was like, like wild, young. Jazz on, introduced me to him. And when I got my chance to be able to put rappers on or put artists on when I was working at Atlantic Records, the first and only person I really wanted to put on was him. I just kept telling him, you know, come to New York, let's do this, come to New York, let's do this. And um, I got told no a hundred times. And um, at one point it was, okay, but I ain't paying for shit. Did he tell you why he was saying no? It was just like he just wasn't? I mean, he, he, he was doing fine. Yeah. <laughs> and the rap game was corny to him. You know what I'm saying? The rappers were corny to him. So um, I totally understood it. It just, to me, it, it, that wasn't the answer because he was too talented. He, to me, I mean, like I, I get, I get, you know, yelled at all the time for saying what I'm about to say. Like I always thought he was better than everybody else. Like it wasn't like a, a natural progression where everybody's like, oh, uh, Melly Mel's the greatest, and then. Uh, uh, Grandmaster Kaz, and then it was Karis One and Rakim and Big Daddy Kane. Nah, like to me, it was like, no, this guy is the illest. Even though nobody had ever heard of him, Jazzo, him and Jazzo, to me, at that precise moment, like nothing was better than those two guys. So those are the guys I wanted to put on. So, but, uh, you know, Jazzo had already had record deals and whatsoever, but now I'm in this position to try to sign an artist. When I finally get him to New York to start recording, my label that I was working for, which was Atlantic Records, was like, uh, nah, I don't want to sign them. So now I'm disturbed. And we're trying to shop them all over the place. In the midst of that, I introduced him to Damon Dash, so Damon starts to manage him. We're still going to every record label with all this music, and they're all going, nah. So then it became, okay, let's just do it ourselves. And we, we did 75% of it in my house, and then, you know, mixed and mastered it out in D&D. And unique studios. So, I mean, you know, it was just a, a belief in the talent, and uh, I was just trying to do my job. So, Shine, like, how, how did that come about? Like, one of my boys, my boy Manny, he's, he used to own a barbershop. He was like, yo, this kid around my way named Shine, he gets busy. So, I'm like, uh, okay. So, he's like, no, you gotta hear him. I'm like, uh, okay. So, I go hear him. And I was like, oh no, this guy's serious. His demo tape was him rhyming from beginning to end of each song and every song was a Jay-Z instrumental. So it was like he was trying to show that he was that ill. But he was crazy. Like he said crazy rhymes and I, so it was, okay I'm gonna start introducing you to people. Let's see what happens. I told Jay about him and when he met Jay, we were in a party and he says, yo man, no disrespect. I might be the, 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 the nicest nigga next to you. So Jay was like, all right, whatever. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I'm never gonna forget this. He like handed him his CD and then he got Frisbee. And I was just like, that's not the way. Not, not with this guy. Like there's no telling you any him that you're ever gonna be nice to him. And there's no telling him that. That's not the way you approach it. Like you, there's a right way and a wrong way. But then I introduced him to Puff and that was it. Like Puff was like not having it. And then, you know, Manny, not off of off of the strength, off of the feeling that 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 yo he's about to be taken seriously. He starts shopping him, so all the bidding wars and all that stuff. But when Puff gets on to something, it's over. But the, the funny part is, I never ever thought he sounded like Big, and I think that's the reason why I paid attention to him. Because if I thought he sounded like Big, I, I wouldn't have paid attention to him. I mean, I understood what people saw later. But when I met him, his voice wasn't that husky. It started growing to be that husky. He was still young. And um, I, I just didn't see what everybody else saw. To me, the bottom line is make a good record. If you make a good record, it don't matter really what you sound like. Sounding like somebody can be detriment to you if you don't make good records. Exactly how many thousand of pairs <laughs> is it of sneakers that you like? Do you even know? Yeah, probably about. 25, 2700 pair of sneakers now. I used to have probably like 5,000. My favorite pair of shoes ever is white and white Air Force One Lows. But to this day. To this day, those are the best shoes ever. White and white Lows, that's it. I can wear white and white Lows for the rest of my life, every day. I gave away a lot to charity because um, there's there's charity and, um, and, and issues that are much bigger than having a bunch of shoes. The, the, the 
pair of sneakers that started me on the foolishness was a pair of um, Pro Kids Royals, and I was nine. And we used to work for this guy on our block, and he used to give us a little money to keep us out of trouble. And um, we worked and we got $10. This is in Brooklyn. Um, it was me and my cousin used to work for him, cleaning his basement. And he gives us $10 a piece. And we know that back then, the Glenwood Flea Market, where you could go buy stuff that wasn't as official as Models, you walk in there, you get a pair of Pro Care Royals for $9. And back then, the bus was 50 cent. <laughs> you take 50 cent to get there, you take 50 cent to get back, you still got the nine dollars to buy the sneakers, buy the sneakers, and if you can get past all of the guys who was trying to rob and steal to get back on the bus, then you got home with your sneakers. And we, we did it every week for two, three years. Mm -hmm. We was buying pro kids, and then, yeah. but I was, I was nine. So when did you seriously get into like heavy Nike, and you were just like, you know, um, to, you it, it had to be like around, 11, 12, when Bruins were the, were the thing, and we were playing street basketball. We were playing for Elmwood League and Citywide Basketball. We were young, yeah. and um, the thing that happened was with when Air Force Ones came around, and we were playing, and, and somebody came and uh, brought some shoes for the team to try and see what they felt like on the court. And um, when I see them, like I was so shook up that I was just like, oh, put these on. And I stuck them in my bag put them under the bench after the game. I was the first person to leave the court because I wanted to get away with the sneakers because they were taking them back. <laughs> okay, so, okay. you know, I just, I took them. I still have them. I still have them brand new. Never worn them because I thought they were just beautiful. 